Hey family, and welcome to Rooted Digital. It's Thursday night here, and we've just recorded our sermon for Sunday's uh, digital gathering. We pray that it's gonna be a real blessing to you. Uh, we're continuing with our series in the Gospel of Mark, and so we're now in chapter 12, verses 28 to 34, the, the greatest commandment. And so we pray that it's gonna be a real blessing for you. Please don't forget to connect with us. Uh, if you'd like to know more about Rooted Fellowship, head over to our website, that's www.rootedfellowship.com. Uh, and perhaps maybe you wanna get connected, you wanna find out more, maybe interact with somebody, then we'd love for you to just kind of hang on to the end of the service. You'll see there, there'll be a slide that comes up with some of our contact details. Uh, if you don't see that, it's community at rootedfellowship.com. That's community at rootedfellowship.com. Uh, we hope to see you one day soon, maybe in person at our in-person gathering. And so uh, looking forward to engaging with you there. Be blessed. Dumelang, via Mokhetwe Momohai, Siena Magula, Air Rooted Digital. Welcome by Ons Aircac, welcome to church. I greet you in the wonderful name of our living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My name is Jono and I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at Rooted Fellowship under the authority of our lead pastor, Ona Mokatle. Now you may recall that as a church, we are still journeying through Mark's gospel. That's how we tend to do things here at Rooted Fellowship. We preach line by line through the books of the Bible and we are coming towards the end of Mark's gospel account, the last quarter, if you will, of Mark's gospel. And today I'm going to be preaching from Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34, six verses, Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. I'm going to be reading from the Christian Standard Bible, the CSB, and so that's Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. If you have a Bible, you can meet us there in that text, or alternatively, you can follow along on the screen. That's Mark 12, uh, 28 to 34. Let's read God's word together. One of the scribes approached. When he heard them debating and saw that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which command is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have correctly said that he is one, and there is no one else except him. And to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is far more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And no one dared to question him any longer. This is the word of the Lord, and so thanks be to our God. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this, your word. Thank you, Lord God, that it is uh, everlasting, that it is true, uh, Lord God, that it speaks truth into our lives today as we gather and as we hear these words. We thank you, Jesus, for making a way for us to come and hear this word, Lord God, for us to, to come and come into uh, God our Father's presence. And so uh, as we do that, we pray, Lord God, that uh, we would draw near to you, Lord God, we thank you that through Jesus in sending your son, you have drawn near to us. And so uh, through our faith in him, we may draw near to you. Holy Spirit, we ask that in this time you would speak so clearly to us, that you, Lord God, would um, build up your church here at Rooted Fellowship, that you would uh, bring comfort to those who are going through challenging circumstances, and that you would challenge those who are comforted. We ask that you would do a mighty work. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak through me, uh, Lord God, that you would speak to the hearts of your people, through me, and that, you, Lord God, that uh, your name, Jesus, would be lifted up and glorified through this, this sermon. We ask this all in Jesus' mighty and holy name. Amen and amen. Now, family, last week, if you recall, Pastor Onia preached an amazing sermon on a big God and how we, as followers of Jesus, should have worn-out Bibles. 
because the Word of God should be our very first priority and first authority uh, that we consult as we go about living the Christian life. It should be our roadmap, if you will, for navigating through our everyday lives. And this we saw flowed from Jesus' interaction with the Sadducees in Mark 12, verses 18 to 27. Now, you may remember that the Sadducees were a group of people who did not believe in the afterlife. And they certainly did not believe in Jesus. And so that's why Pastor One left us with the question of, do we accept Jesus as the Messiah, God's one and only Son who lived the perfect sinless life, who died an all-sufficient death, who rose again, who ascended into heaven and is seated at God's side, and who will return to make all things new? Do we accept that God the Father sent him, and do we believe in him as our Lord and Savior? Now, if you're not a Christian, please don't check out because we are going to see that even the man who comes to, che to Jesus in our text today is not yet a follower of Jesus. And yet Jesus engages with him and gives him some things to think about. But family, if our answer to the question, is Jesus your Lord and Savior, if the answer is yes, then our text for today has some serious, serious implications for those who call themselves followers of Jesus. If we call ourselves followers of Jesus and if we love God our Father, then we will see from our text today that this is hugely significant. It's hugely significant and it means something for the way in which we live our lives. But as we saw from last week, don't take, just take my word for it, right? Uh, we learned that last week. So let's dive deeper and take a closer look into what the Lord, Word of God says. Let's read verse 28 together. Verse 28, Matthew 12, Mark 12. One of the scribes approached, and in fact, other translations even refer to this man as a lawyer. And so commentators suggest that this man must have been a scribe for the Pharisees. And family, remember, we have seen as we have gone through Mark's gospel that the Pharisees had a strong uh, obsession or infatuation with the law. They were ritualists and they were legalistic. Okay, so when he, the scribe, heard them, them being the Sadducees, remember from the preceding verses from last week, so when this Pharisee law writer heard the Sadducees debating and saw that Jesus had answered the Sadducees well, he asked Jesus, which command is the most important of all? Which command is the most important of all? Now, family, there are a couple of things to take note of here. Firstly, this question is asked by this man, okay? And this question by asked by this man can be contrasted to the preceding questions Jesus has been fielding on the Tuesday of Holy Week, three days before his crucifixion. You'll recall that the other questions posed to Jesus by the groups of Pharisees, the Sanhedrin or the Jewish High Court, uh, the Herodians and the Sadducees all had hidden agendas behind them. They were either trying to trick Jesus, to trip him up and show how great and clever they were. But here, in this verse, in Mark 12, verse 28, we have a Pharisee law writer courageously on his own, genuinely and humbly asking Jesus a question that he would genuinely like an answer to. And in front of many other Pharisees. And so this would not have been a popular move. Secondly, it's important to note why this man asks this specific question. Why does he ask this question? Well, the Jews consider themselves righteous, right with God, if they were careful to obey the commandments written in the Jewish law. Jews considered the Ten Commandments found in Exodus 20 central to their faith. Along with those concerning sacrifices and offerings, they also found those central to their faith. And so if a Jewish person obeyed the Ten Commandments and performed all the proper sacrifices and offerings, they were considered righteous, right with God. However, on top of this, the Pharisees' code of morality consisted of many 
many, many written traditions, rules, and regulations. By Jesus' time, the Jews had accumulated 613 laws by one historian's account. 613 laws by one historian's account. And many Jewish religious leaders would teach that there were major laws, there were minor laws, whilst others taught that all laws were equally binding and it was dangerous to make distinctions. And so in Jesus' day, it was common practice for Jewish teachers and lawmakers to attempt to make profound and concise summaries of the Jewish laws. And in fact, it was even common practice for the prophets found within the Old Testament to make statements which sought to sum up the very essence of the law. In Micah 6 verse 8, the prophet writes, Mankind, he has told each of you what is good and what it is the Lord requires of you. This is a very well-known verse, to act justly to love faithfulness and to walk humbly with your God. To act justly, to love faithfulness and to walk humbly with your God. And so, as summarizing and law writing was this man's job, he then comes to Jesus with a genuine question and seeking to learn a great summary from Jesus the teacher. And as an aside, remember, Jesus is still surrounded by many groups, many of whom spent time debating and discussing all of these laws. And so they too would want to hear what Jesus has to say. And no doubt, Jesus' response is going to get to them. It's going to get to them. Now, family, this is probably a sermon for another day. But how do we come to Jesus? How do you come to Jesus? How do we make our questions and requests known to God in prayer? How do we come to God's word? Do we come with surrendered and open hearts and minds and hands, willing to be led by his word and his Holy Spirit, willing to be taught by the teacher? I mean, as we've read in Mark chapter 12, we've seen how the Pharisees, the Herodians and the Sadducees have come to Jesus with their agendas looking for their beliefs to be affirmed, looking for Jesus to be tricked. And honestly, we've probably thought to ourselves how foolish these guys are. But family, I think if we are really honest, do we not do the same? Do we not do the very same thing? Do we surrender our agendas to God's word or do we come with our preconceived ideas of what God should be saying on the matter? And then when his word says something else, we say... I'm not really sure, I'm not sure if this God and his church and the whole Christian thing is for me anymore. Or do we come like this scribe does? And honestly, family, this scribe is not even a believer in Jesus yet. We are not told more about him after this. But notice how he comes to Jesus. He comes boldly. His fellow Pharisees would certainly have been surprised by the way in which he humbly and genuinely came seeking to be taught by Jesus. And so church, do we come to God seeking to know his ways so that they may become our ways too? Because we know that God is good. He is loving and he is for our flourishing. Back to the text. Verses 29 and 30. Jesus answered the man, or the scribe, the most important is, listen to Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your, family, I ask you to say it with me, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, take special note of that one, please, and with all your strength. Let's read it again. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Here in these verses, Jesus quotes from the Jewish Shema, written in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 5, which says, very similarly, Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now, the Jews knew the Shema very well. The Shema was repeated twice each day, and it represented the very essence, very essence of Judaism, namely that knowledge of God, Yahweh, comes before the knowledge of oneself or of others. The knowledge 
of God, Yahweh, comes before knowledge of oneself or of others. The Shema not only defines the person of God in terms of his unity, but it also defines the nature of the relationship that God's people are to have with him and with one another. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Jesus is saying that there is a higher, greater, or more important law than rule-keeping, sacrifices, and offerings. We are to love God with our whole being and not hold back anything from God. We either, we either accept Jesus, God the Son, as our Lord and Savior, or we do not. We cannot be somewhat near to Him or somewhat devoted to him, or count ourselves as Christians because we grew up in church, and we kind of know how things work. In fact, in Revelation 3.16, Jesus says to the highly competent, highly capable, affluent, and self-reliant church in Laodicea, but since you are lukewarm, since you are lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out from my mouth. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Now, perhaps you've already picked this up, and you may have noticed that when Jesus quoted the Shema, um, he draws it out even more, and he gets more specific as he included the words, with all of your mind. And in fact, the Greek word used in this verse for mind is dianoia, dianoia, which means to literally think through to literally think through, thus suggesting loving God even with all of our understanding, all of our insights, all of our reflections, all of our thoughts. And so family, on the one hand, Jesus is saying, much like we saw last week, that we need to seek to know and even study the things of God graciously revealed to us by Him in His Word, and we need to do this as followers of Jesus, no matter what our relative academic or educational abilities and qualifications are. I myself have a theology degree, and yet I do not know the Word of God like I could. In fact, confession time, can I be really real for a second? I'm not sure at times I even have the desire to know and understand it as much as I could. But Jesus is indeed calling me to do so. And family, at the same time, Jesus is also calling us to set our minds on him. We need to set our minds on him, to seek for our thoughts to be his thoughts. How much this world at this time needs people whose minds are renewed by the Holy Spirit, who are not full of fear and pessimism and the things of this world, but instead they are full of eternal hope, the eternal hope that we have in Christ Jesus. This was true some 2,000 years ago. It's true today. But even in Paul's time, in the Apostle Paul's time, that's why Paul writes in Romans 8 verse 5, he writes, For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. And so Paul goes on to say later, Romans 12, verse 2, he says, So do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Brothers and sisters, these words remain ever true for the followers of Christ. We need to fill our minds with the things of God so that when the tough times, pandemics, death, lost jobs, relationship strife, trials come, we can respond and remind ourselves and those in our midst of the hope, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. He is with us, he is for us, and he is coming back to make all things new, amen? And so, with that, we are called to, verse 30, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. Jesus then goes on 
in verse 31. The second is, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. And here, Jesus is now quoting Leviticus 19, 18, which says, do not take revenge or bear a grudge against members of your community, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Family, let's get really real once again. One of the greatest indicators that we are growing, that we are growing in our relationship with God is found in our willingness to unconditionally love as God does. God is love, amen? Love is not just something that God does, it is who God is. Therefore, we are never more godly or like God than when we love unconditionally. Now, at first glance, these two verses and these two commandments may seem super simple. But in actual fact, they are incredibly difficult. Or we may look at the two commandments and say, I can easily love God, love Jesus, but I really, really struggle to love my neighbor. Family, Jesus inextricably linked he links these two commandments, the second to the first. In fact, in Matthew's gospel account, Matthew records Jesus as saying, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. We cannot fulfill the first commandment to love God without loving our neighbors. In fact, John addresses this very same matter. In his first letter, in 1 John 4, verse 20, he writes, if anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. For the person who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And church, we also can't get around this issue by narrowing our definition of the word neighbor to people from our neighborhood that look like us, think like us, vote like us. We cannot restrict our neighbor to people within our blood family, our race, our worldly perspective, our economic class, our intellectual level, our value system, or even our religion, our belief system. Because in Luke's gospel in chapter 10, the story of the Good Samaritan comes up. The gospel writer notes Jesus' definition of, of, of the word neighbor here to include anyone God puts on our path who needs us. Anyone God puts on our path who, who needs us. And so church, we need to hear once again that since the beginning of time, since the beginning of time, God has been on mission, forming a family for himself from all people. And so family, to grow in our love for God is to grow in our obedience to God. To grow in our love for God is to grow in our obedience to God. Jesus says so in John 14, the Gospel of John 14 verse 15, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Then six verses later in John 14, 21, Jesus says, the one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my father. I will also love him and will reveal myself to him. And then he says, two verses later in John 14, verses 23 to 24, Jesus answered, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. The one who doesn't love me will not keep my words. The word that you hear is not mine, but it is from the Father who sent me. Church, don't miss it. Let's not miss it. Our obedience to God's ways must not be like that of the hypocritical Pharisees. We must not be like the Pharisees. Their obedience to the law was not out of love for God, but instead rather to show others how religious they were. Brother, sister, I ask you, as you sit here, wherever you find yourself today, why do you obey God? Why do you obey God? Is it because you love Him? Or is it because it kind of makes you feel good. 
You feel puffed up, elevated, better than others. Or is it to show others how devoted you are? Why do you show love to others? Is it because you're guilty and feel ashamed? Is it because your love of God spills over into loving others through the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you? Or is it to show others how generous and great you are? Sisters, brothers, friends, these two commandments fulfill the intent of the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments are concerned with loving God. We find that in Exodus 20. And the last six of the Ten Commandments are concerned with loving our neighbor. And so these two commandments really do fulfill the intent of the Ten Commandments and the other laws as set out in the Old Testament. And according to Jesus, they summarize all of God's laws which Jesus came to fulfill. But family, they are not to be followed because God is burdensome and we must just do so out of duty or to look good in front of others. They are not there so that we experience no joy. In fact, quite the opposite. They are there to guide our wandering thoughts, to guide our decisions, to guide our actions for our good and for our flourishing and for the flourishing of God's children. And so it is my prayer today that as we face life as Jesus' followers and as uncertainty and life's issues arise, that we would pray to God and ask which course of action best demonstrates love for God and for others. And then to ask His Holy Spirit to give us the ability to carry those May our decisions and our actions come from a place of loving God and loving others. Moving on to verse 32. Verse 32. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You are right. You have correctly said that he is one and that there is no one else except him. And to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is far more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. You see, this scribe would also have known what, that, that what Jesus had just said was in line with what the prophet Hosea's words say in Hosea 6 verse 6, which says that God desires faithful love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. God desires faithful love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. But there's a couple of other things to note here that are of incredibly important significance. When the scribe says to love your neighbor as yourself is far more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices, what he's doing here is he's contrasting this with what is going on in the background and what has been going on during Holy Week. Remember, it's Tuesday of Holy Week. The previous day, Jesus had cleansed the temple, and here now Jesus is back the next day, most likely once again in the temple courts. And remember what used to happen at the Jewish temple. Burnt offerings and sacrifices. But we saw in Mark 11, when Jesus cleansed the temple, that there was certainly not a lot of loving your neighbor going on. There was not a lot of loving your neighbor going on in Mark 11. In fact, if you remember from a few weeks back in Mark 11, the Jewish religious and political leaders, which included the Pharisees, the Herodians, and the Sadducees, had been taking advantage of their Gentile neighbors in the very temple of God. Remember from the message that Pastor Seclia preached, they were charging them exorbitant prices for their own stock of sacrificial animals, whilst preventing the Gentiles from offering their own animals as sacrifices resulting in Jesus turning tables over in protest and whipping these opportunistic money makers. And so when this Pharisee scribe says in front of all these groups and probably in front of other sacrifices and burnt offerings taking place, to love your neighbor as yourself is far more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices we can see that because of where this is happening and who it's happening in front of, that he is in fact affirming Jesus' teachings and actions over those 
of the corrupt religious and political leaders in Jerusalem. And it seems clear from his response that this Pharisee scribe has grasped the intent. He's grasped the intent of God's law. That true obedience comes only from the heart. You see, church, all the Old Testament commands lead to Christ. Amen? Jesus himself says in Matthew 5, verse 17, you may remember this uh, from our Upside Down series, Sermon on the Mount, we did two years ago. Now Jesus says, Matthew 5, verse 17, don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And so then Mark writes, Mark 12, verse 34, when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You're not far from the kingdom of God. And no one dared to question him any longer. So why is it that no one dared to question Jesus any longer? Well, Jesus had answered so many questions so well on this Tuesday of Holy Week after entering Jerusalem on Sunday, cleansing the temple on Monday, Jesus returns on Tuesday and answers all the religious and political leaders' questions which sought to try and trap him and find him guilty of either blasphemy or citing violence against the government. But then he even answers one of the Pharisees' own scribes, who is beginning to see that Jesus really does know what he's talking about. And so the religious and political leaders' plan A had now failed. They had failed to trick and trap Jesus, and now some of their own are perhaps even beginning to be influenced by Jesus. And so what do they do? They move on to plan B, asking Judas, Jesus' disciple, to betray him. But let's take a, look, a closer look or a longer look at the first part of verse 34. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You're not far. When preaching on this very same text, Dr. Tony Merida, who's a close friend of Rooted Fellowship, he said that this scribe had theological clarification, but he did not yet have a personal obligation. The scribe had theological clarification, but he did not yet have a personal obligation. The next step for this scribe was faith in Jesus himself. But this was the most difficult step for him to take. As I mentioned earlier, the Bible doesn't say anything about whether or not this man became a true believer. But family, we need to take heed. Being close to being a follower of Jesus is infinitely far away if a person never commits their hearts and lives to Christ. Salvation does not find its security in intellectual knowledge. And so friend, where are you today? Are you close, so close to being in the kingdom of God? Perhaps you know all the right answers. Perhaps you take comfort in the fact that you have great theology. You're here at church following all the rules, doing the things, showing up for your discipleship spaces, and you're in city group. You're the first name on every attendance sheet, serving. But I ask you, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Have you willingly surrendered your life to the servant king? Do you truly desire to love God and love others? Do you truly desire to love God and love others? Or do you do this because of how good it makes you look? It is my prayer that today you would turn from these ways, that you would repent, truly follow Jesus, and become a new creation in the power of His Holy Spirit. Friend, may you not be comforted by merely being close, but instead would you take the step and make this commitment. And then family of God, Jesus followers, Christians, let's be honest. I think these words can be quite the wake-up call. If we're really honest, they can be quite the wake-up call. Firstly, 
because we can see that what God requires of us is really more than we could ever in our sinful human state ever, ever offer God. We do not love the Lord our God with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our minds, and with all of our strength. And secondly, we do not love our neighbor the way God requires us to do so. But family, I have good news. In fact, I have the good news. There was someone who did this for us. Amen? Jesus Christ loved God and us all the way to the cross, where he died for our sins to pay the price for our salvation so that we may have eternal life through believing in him as our Lord and Savior. And when we have accepted Jesus for who he is and what he did for us, we then receive his Holy Spirit who empowers us to love God and our neighbor the way that Jesus did. Because God's Spirit is now at work in and through us. Amen. And so what good news that is today. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you just adoring you for who you are. We adore you for the fact that you are merciful, that you are good, that you are for us. Lord God, we thank you that, that you made a way. Lord God, that you are a just God. You saw what was happening here, Lord God, as, you, as creation fell, but you made a way through sending your son, Jesus Christ. And so we thank you, Lord God. We thank you that, that we have the privilege of knowing you because of what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. We confess, Lord God, that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor the way that we should, Lord God. But in your grace and in your mercy and in your goodness, you have, uh, Lord God, you have made a way for us to, to be completely acceptable and received in your sight. And that through that, Lord God, through our salvation secured by Christ Jesus, we are empowered and enabled to go out and be a blessing to others, to love you, Lord God, with our whole heart, in the power of the Holy Spirit, which is now at work and alive inside of us. I pray, Lord God, that this message would encourage us. It would encourage us to, to love you, to seek, to know you, to understand you, to set our, our thoughts upon you in the midst of everything that's going on at this time. I pray, Lord God, that we would be awakened to our neighbors who come across us uh, in, on the roads that we travel, Lord God those who are in need, I pray that you would open our eyes to them and to the opportunities to love them. We pray for all those who would hear this message, Lord God, where may it bear fruit in our lives and may it bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.